Hey, Pastor Harold here from Abundant Life for Scythe Church. I want to say thank you for tuning in today uh, via Facebook, YouTube, whatever you may be doing to watch this service. I believe God has a word for you. I hope you'll watch the entire video today and may God touch you through it. But look, if you want more than just a video, you want a personal experience, you want to feel the presence of God, I want to invite you out to Abundant Life for Scythe, 962 Juliet Road. Look, we have a lot of stuff happening here. Sunday mornings at 9 a.m., we have my groups, which uh, covers a variety of age groups, women's ministry, men's ministry, all these things are happening. Also, Sunday mornings at 10.30 is when our worship service starts, followed by the preaching of the word. Then Tuesday nights at 6 p.m., we got prayer meeting. Wednesday nights, we got a, a Bible study slash preaching that happens at 7 p.m. with youth ministry, children's ministry once again. And now we also offer Celebrate Recovery at 7 p.m. on Thursday night. Look, there's a lot happening right here in Forsyth, Georgia, and I believe God gave you this video today to help you get connected. So I want to encourage you, I want to invite you to come out and be a part of what's happening. I personally want to meet you. If you'll come down here and you'll let me know that you watch this video, I have a special gift just for you. Hey, God bless you. I appreciate you watching this, and I hope to see you soon. How many of you happy to be in the house? Hey, Jordan, before you leave, turn me down in the monitor just a little bit closer. Just a little bit closer. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. That, 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 thank you. If I get too loud out there tonight, y'all just look at me and shake your head. Or shake your finger at me. And then I, you shake your head, I'm just going to make you agree with me. Amen. Rebecca, you can go ahead and step away. I'm not even going to read scripture to start with. Mike. Mel Jim, you can go ahead and sit down. Thank you for that. Hallelujah. I got I got to, I got to mix it up on y'all around here a little bit every now and then. I can't let y'all get used to the same old thing all the time. Amen? Yeah. All right. Well, tonight, uh, man, I just feel like I'm really hot. Is it really hot? Not hot, like hot, but is it hot out there? Like, is, am I loud is what I'm saying. Is it loud? Is it loud? If, when I get right here, is it loud out there? It's loud out there. Brent, if you'll just take the main house feed and turn me down, because I'm going I'm to keep it right there. I'll try to hold down here, but it just don't work. I'll try. But uh, tonight, I wanted to, to kind of do a little bit, just a, a, just a quick teaching like, Probably ain't going to be preaching, so if you want to preach, you'll have to come back Monday. I mean Sunday. <laughs> come back Sunday, which is Pentecost Sunday. Amen. Amen. So we're going to be ready to just to get full of the Holy Ghost Sunday. Amen. But I wanted to talk about uh, tongues tonight. Uh, we seem to have some people that are uncertain about some things and how tongues operates, and it's creating a little bit of confusion within the body, so... Uh, you know, I, I want you, if you if you have on Facebook, go on on Facebook right now and share this because some of them ain't here tonight, and I was hoping they was going to be here. So you need to go on and share it so maybe they'll see it on Facebook tonight. So take your phone out, share it on Facebook, this live post right here. Amen. Go live. Go live. Are we live, Brent? Before I say that, we are live. All right. So I'm not going to do any uh, scripture reading to start with, but we're going to get into a lot of scripture tonight. A lot of scripture. And uh, so I want you just to stay with me because I'm going to jump back and forth through scriptures and so forth. But I want to talk about the biggest thing that is in the Pentecostal realm, and that's speaking in tongues. It's one of the most widely created uh, uh, controversies among Christians today uh, of the gifts. 
You can go to just about any church, no matter what denomination, and they believe in this, they believe in that, they believe, but when you get to tongues, they don't believe in it. And so I, I kind of covered this when we did the Holy Spirit series, but tonight I'm going to do more of just a teaching on it. But the problem is with most churches and most people, most individuals, is they don't have knowledge of the truth. They're not being taught it. And if you're not taught it, you cannot understand it. It does not mean that you're, you're dumb or stupid or any of that. No, it doesn't mean any of that. It just means you haven't been taught it. You know, as kids, all of us in here, we would have never learned what one plus one was until we went to school and somebody taught it to us. It just didn't happen overnight. So we, we have to be taught these things. So the thing of it is, to get taught some things, man can teach only so much. And understand when I say man, you know I mean woman too. I don't disclose that. Uh, I don't uh, not include women. Uh, but sometimes we have to be taught from the Holy Spirit. We have to have a revelation from, from God tonight. So, uh, so many have un misunderstood the purpose of the tongues. So I, I want to I kind of set the record straight based on Scripture. Can I say it like that? Because there's so many theories and there's so many ideas of man out there. But to learn the truth uh, about this is to be asking the Holy Spirit to enlighten us. And so we're going to pray right now. We're going to ask the Holy Spirit to enlighten us tonight. All right? And that's what I want you to pray. I just want you to pray after me. Say, Father. I ask, I ask you tonight to enlighten, to enlighten. Illuminate, illuminate everything, everything that I need to hear, that I need to, hear, that I need to read, that I need to, read to, help me, to help me the gifts of the Holy Ghost, especially the gift of tongues. Now, Father, I have asked and now I receive revelation from heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap for what he's about to do. So there's three ways that tongues are uh, manifested. You have the initial evidence of the Holy Spirit, which is the uh, speaking of tongues, which is your prayer language. You have the baptism, uh, I mean, you have the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which comes. And then you have a, per a person's uh, personal devotion to God. So maybe I said that right, maybe I didn't say that right, because I'm just kind of got jotted notes down. So I want to take some time tonight and give clear understanding. So let's look at the initial evidence of the Holy Spirit baptism. And, and, and understand, I'm fixing to demolish. I'm fixing to demolish some religious mindsets. You may not be in here, but you're watching. Some religious mindsets tonight and beliefs. But don't get mad at me. Get mad at the Word of God, because I'm taking it straight out of the Word. In Isaiah 28, 11, I got a lot of scripture. Brent may be able to keep up. If not, I'm going to try to go slow enough to let you write it down. In Isaiah 28, 11, the prophet Isaiah said, With stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to his people. In Mark chapter 16, verse 17, Jesus said, And these signs shall follow them that believe. They shall speak with new tongues. John 3, 8 says, The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind, but can't tell where it comes from or where it is going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. Now listen to me. Just as the sound of the wind blowing is the evidence of God's presence, so is the sound of speaking in tongues the evidence of the Holy Spirit baptism. All right. So let me give you a couple more scriptures. Acts 2, 1 and 4. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a what? Sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The initial evidence of the Holy Ghost that came upon the 120 uh, disciples or people that was gathered there was the witnessed by devout Jews out of every nation at that time. Okay? And it said they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Acts 2, 7 and 8 says... And they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear uh, we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? In Acts 2, 14 through 18, I'm, I'm telling you, give you a lot of scripture tonight. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, for these are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day or nine o'clock in the morning. 
But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, and you can find this in Joel 2.28. And it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. If we skip down to verse 33, it says, Therefore being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. Is everybody with me so far? I know I'm going to go fast, but I got a lot to cover. Everybody good? Thumbs up? All right. Cornelius and his household spoke in tongues when they were baptized with the Holy Ghost, Acts 10, 45 and 47. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Ghost just as we have? Peter again in Acts 11.5 said, And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. Now let me just go on and crush some religious mindsets. You do not have to be water baptized to receive the Holy Ghost. There are people that believe that you cannot receive it unless you have been water baptized. I just gave you two sets of scriptures that said that after they received it, then they were baptized. Or what would should forbid them from being water baptized. Peter even said it was like it was given to us at the beginning. What was the beginning? In the upper room. And if I remember correctly, then none of them get baptized in the upper room with water. But it came from a mighty rushing wind. So they tarried in the upper room. So for someone to say the only way to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost is to go down in water is not according to Scripture. That's what the Scripture says. The believers at Ephesus spoke in tongues when they received the Holy Ghost baptism as well. Acts 19, 6. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, what did it say? When Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There again, it did not mention water. Now in this incident, they had been baptized with water beforehand. But it said it wasn't until the laying on of hands that they got baptized with the Holy Ghost. They had already come up out of the water and didn't get baptized with the Holy Ghost. Does everybody understand where I'm at? All right. When the Samaritans received the Holy Ghost by the laying on of the apostles' hands, there was a miraculous evidence of God's power which exceeded the miracles and signs that were already experienced. How do I know this? Because Simon the sorcerer was willing to pay money for it. All right? The Bible says that he said that whomsoever he lay his hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. This was Simon. According to biblical signs that follow believers and the experiences received at Pentecost, there should be no doubt that the Samaritans received the Holy Ghost through the same initial evidence of speaking in tongues. Is everybody with me? You can see that in Acts 8, 5 through 25. Now, the Apostle Paul was filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke in tongues as well. Acts 9, 17 through 18, and 1 Corinthians 14 and 18. As we know, he was knocked down on the road to Damascus, correct? And he went to the house, and as he got prayed for, the scales fell off his eyes, and he was baptized with the Holy Ghost. Once again, he was not gone down in water. Now, history also proves that speaking in tongues was the evidence of the Holy Spirit baptism in the early church. And it did not cease because some people died out. Amen. Amen. It is still here today. The Word of God said He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means that everything that takes place can still happen today. Amen. Now, in the Britannica Encyclopedia, it says this right here. Tongue speaking manifested itself early in the Christian experience at Pentecost. The gift appeared as a sign of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit which marked the character of the earliest Christians. During later church history, glossolalia, which means speaking in tongues, occurred among the mendicant friars of the 13th century. Little prophets of Kevinines and the Jansenites 
and the Irvingites. Now, you just understand. Amen. I'm doing the best I can. Tongues were also found among the early Quakers as well as the converts of John Wesley and George Whitfield. In modern times, glossolalia has been found chiefly among holiness and Pentecostal groups. In 1964, there was a thing written that said, Praying in tongues has recurred at intervals throughout the Christian era, although it did not affect large masses until early in this century. Now, why was that? Did it just not get practiced anymore? Was there so much doctrines going on? I don't know what it was, but it goes on to say that advocates were quickly expelled from the established churches, whereupon they established the Pentecostal churches. So it was happening, understand what that said, it was happening in other churches, not just the Pentecostal church. And then it got shut down in other churches, and then we just had the Pentecostal denomination come out. So for 50 years, it remained almost exclusive possession of the Pentecostal church. In June, on June 25th, 1973, Newsweek article said, The Pentecostal phenomenon has spread with surprising speed through all the world's major Christian churches. It started back up, that's what they called the Jesus movement, back in the late 60s and the early 70s, when the Pentecostal movement got so big and, and widely spread, the Holy Spirit was actually going through other churches. So let me ask you this, why did God choose the initial evidence of the Holy Spirit baptism? Why did he choose to speak in the tongues? Okay, I'm glad you asked. Now, in Isaiah 40, 13, Isaiah said, Who had directed the Spirit of the Lord of being his counselor hath taught him? God is sovereign. Amen? Amen? He can choose as he will without being accountable to anyone. Why? Because he's God. Amen. So we must not say to God how it has to be done. All right? So, so when people say, well, it has to be done this way or this way in order to get it. No, no, no. They're not God. God can do it however he wants to, whenever he wants to. It can be when somebody ain't even being prayed for. It can be. I'm trying not to preach. I'm just telling you. I'm going to get riled up right here. We've had someone in this church. I'm not going to mention any names. We had someone in this church not too long ago. Someone was getting prayed for the, for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They had been prayed for, had not received it yet. Went back to their seat. And I think I had either said that morning. Was it that morning I said that? I think I'd said that morning, I said, you know, don't get mad at somebody, but we need to praise just like it's happening to you. And as that person was getting mad, said they remembered what I just had said and started praising God for that other individual getting baptized. And they got baptized with the Holy Ghost back there in their seat, nobody touching and laying hands on them. So for us to say it has to be done a specific way says that I am God and I am in control of everything. And that's not the case. God is God and he doesn't answer to anyone. All right, so why else? Because it is a marvelous experience that happens at the Holy Ghost baptism. And a marvelous experience demands a marvelous evidence. And what is that? The tongues. So God chose to speak through the believer in a language foreign to the believer as an outward evidence that the infilling of the Holy Ghost had taken place. Amen. Now, remember the Bible says the tongue is the most unruly member yes. of the body. Watch, yeah, watch this right here. And full of deadly poison which no man can tame. All right? It's a world of iniquity and is set on fire of hell. Watch this. James 3, 6 says, Therefore the tongue is capable of defiling the entire body. Before man can be fully sanctified, the tongue which defileth must be brought under control. Who can tame the tongue? James compares the tongue to the bit in a horse's mouth which gives the driver what? Complete control. James 3, 3. So whoever controls the tongue, watch this, controls the person. Uh, watch this now. So God chose tongues as evidence of the Holy Spirit baptism to symbolize 
He has complete control of a believer. Uh, you ain't never seen it like that before. That heavenly language, that's the Father. He is controlling your life. It's important to understand for the sanctification of your body, your spirit. Mm, is to be lined up and let God have control. So when we give over to the Holy Spirit and we have the, the, uh, the gift of the Holy Ghost, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, then we are allowing God to take control of us. Do you understand that? All right. Now, though other signs have been ma uh, manifested at Pentecost, God chose tongues for the uniform, the unity, so to speak, of the Holy Spirit baptism. Acts 2, we just talked about it where they was all in one accord. They all were speaking tongues. And Jesus said that this sign shall follow for every believer. That's what he said in Mark 16. The Jews were convinced now that the Gentiles at Caesarea had received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. For why? For they heard them speak with tongues. Acts 10, 45 through 47. You can find that. So, the gift of tongues in the church, look at, let's look at this, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. In 12, 4, 1 Corinthians, it says, now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. In 12, uh, chapter 12, verse 8 and 11, it says, but the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of the spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretations of the tongues. But one and the same Spirit, the big S, works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So that just no, blows another religious mindset that says you can only have one gift. It says he will distribute to each one as he wills. Look, he can give you the gift of healings right now, and 20 minutes later he can give you the gift of tongues. And 20 minutes after that he can give you the gift of prophecy. The Holy Spirit can do what he wants to. So once again, when we say no, he can't do it, then we're saying that we're God and he's not. Now, since the gift of tongues is a manifestation of the Spirit, chapter 12, verse 7 and 11, it cannot operate in a person without the Holy Ghost being a resident within them. Mm. Now that brings a whole nother can of worms to open up. But we'll get there in a minute. Therefore, the gift is only given to believers who have been baptized in the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. Do you understand that? You have to have the Holy Ghost baptism in order to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. Okay. The gift of tongues is different from the tongues as the initial, initial evidence of the Holy Ghost baptism. All right, so let's look at this. They differ in purpose. The gift of tongues, along with the gift of interpretation of tongues, gives, is given to people in the church to convey a message from God to a congregation at the time that it needs something. All right? So, and Lord knows my heart. I'm not making fun. I'm not making a mockery. Understand what I'm saying. But the Holy Ghost will not speak in tongues in here and give an interpretation that McDonald's is having free double cheeseburger meals. That's nothing that has anything to do with a hill of beans in China. Understand that. So, we know that anytime the Holy Spirit has a gift of tongues and interpretations, it's going to line up, number one, with the Word of God somewhere in there. Understand that. It will line up with the Word of God. And the reason I say it's for the congregation, you can find in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, 27, and 28, it talks about it. Now, the tongues as the evidence of receiving the Holy Ghost is the personal experience with God and does not and is not designed to convey a message to the church body. All right. Is everybody with me so far? Now, tongues differ in operation. The gift of tongues in the church is limited. Somebody say limited. To two or three messages that by course, one has to be interpreted. So we can have a gift of tongues, interpretation, gift of tongues, but it cannot be more than three. 
If it is, it's going to get shut down. Amen, Pastor. If it's not lining up with the Word of God, then I have to shut it down because it means it's outside of the Word of God. And it brings confusion to everyone. 1 Corinthians 14, 27, you can find that. But the tongues as evidence of the Holy Spirit is an unlimited, somebody say unlimited, unlimited. manifestation and it requires no interpretation. Now, this is where people that walk into this church that are not spirit-filled and have not grown up in a Pentecostal church get confused. Now, listen to me. I am not getting on to anybody because I do this myself. But listen to this scripture, 1 Corinthians 14, 4 through 5. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edify himself. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret, that the church may receive edifying. Now, what happens is people comes in, and we over here speaking in tongues in our prayer language, and we loud, and they go, this ain't right because it's, it's not being interpreted. Do you understand where people get that from? So they walk out of here, and they say them people are crazy because I know what the Word of God says, and the Word of God tells me it should have been interpreted, and it was not interpreted. Now, I don't know about you, but when I pray in my natural, I get a little loud. Amen. I may start off, Father, thank you for this day, but by the end of it, I done got a little loud. That's the same thing that happens in our prayer language. Sometimes we start off quietly praying in our prayer language, but we get excited. Why? Because as we pray in our prayer language, who are we talking to? We're talking to the Father. And as we're talking to the Father, He's depositing stuff inside of us, and we start to feel His presence, and we get excited. So when we get excited, we get a little bit loud. But in reality, we create a little bit of confusion. So understand that when you're praying in your prayer language. Now, am I saying that Sunday morning everybody needs to be in here like, no, 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 no. that's not what I'm saying. Understand what I'm saying. But there has to be a difference, a noticeable difference between the two. Understand that. The Apostle Paul did not try to discredit or do away with the importance of tongues. Because he illustrated that the, the lesser of the two was actually more honorable. How do I know that? Because he, he says it in 1 Corinthians. Again, I'm going to get to there in just a minute. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 22 and 23. Each gift of the Spirit has its proper time and place in the church. All right. When tongues are interpreted, they become as important as somebody given a prophetic word. Paul emphasized that in 1 Corinthians 14, 26. He said, let all things be done unto edifying. To edify the church, the gift of tongues must be together with the gift of interpretation of tongues. To avoid confusion, Paul said to follow, uh, uh, for, for the use of tongues, interpretation of tongues, he said in 14, 27, 28, if anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. If there be no interpreter, listen to what he says. Let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. So what's he saying? He's talking about your prayer language. Let him keep silent and keep to himself. Now, as Pentecostals, we don't know how to be quiet. Amen. So we like to be a little loud. We like to be vocal because we're excitable people. So understand, though, if you're in your prayer language, you need to keep it to a certain octave. Is everybody clear with what I'm saying, what I'm, I'm teaching? All right? Nobody mad at me yet. Thumbs up, everybody. All right. In 1 Corinthians 14, 19, it said, In the church, it's Paul talking, I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. So what is he saying there? If I'm in my prayer language and I'm so loud I'm being distracted, I ain't doing any good justice to the body of Christ. So it would be better for me to stand up and say, Jesus is Lord. I did more with that than just speaking in my prayer language that I was just shutting everybody out. 
Do you understand that? However, do not let anyone misunderstand the importance because in 1439, Paul said, Wherefore, brethren, convey the prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Now, he's talking about the gift of tongues here, okay? So when people say, well, tongues ain't for today, he said, do not forbid to speak with tongues. In 1 Corinthians 14, 22, it says, Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. And I've gave this to you before. That means those that are unlearned. Not that they're not a believer. It's they are unlearned. So therefore, we have to teach people the scriptures. All right? In 14, 21, it says, In the law it is written with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people, and yet for all that they will not hear me, says the Lord. He's going back to Old Testament scripture here. Okay? Now, of course, the believers should know when the Lord is speaking, whether by tongues or not. What am I saying? As you get the gift of tongues, interpretation of whatever gift it may be, we're going to make mistakes. All right? It's just how it's going to be. But we can't point fingers at everybody when we make mistakes. But here's where the body has to be teachable. <laughs> I knew it was going to be tough tonight. <laughs> this is where the body has to be teachable. Because so many people get offended when you bring correction. And if they would just understand the reason for the correction, it would make everything a lot better. Amen. So, we have to make sure that we, matter of fact, just raise your hand. Say, Lord, Lord make, me teachable. make me teachable. Make me not get offended, not get offended. When, I when I am corrected. Amen. Amen. Now, as proof to the unbeliever or anyone who doubts the word of God, tongues are manifested for a sign of his presence. That's why it says it's to the unbeliever, all right? The tongue is for the unlearned. A lot of times we have the gift of tongues come when there's a newcomer in the house, maybe someone that is not saved, maybe someone that is still not uh, sure about the Holy Ghost or the, uh, speaking in tongues, and sometimes the word that will come, the interpretation, will be just for them. And it'll hit them right between the eyes. And it'll be they like, that has to be God because... Nobody knew that. And that's the Holy Spirit talking. Paul asked the question in 1 Corinthians 12, 30. He said, do all speak with tongues? Now, when he said that, it almost requires a negative answer, doesn't it? Do all speak with tongues? Well, we know. No. All don't speak with tongues, do they? Now, as Paul's discussing tongues as a gift of the Spirit only and not as the evidence of the baptism. You can have your prayer language and not speak in tongues. Praise God. You can have, let me say it again, you can have your prayer language and not have the gift of speaking in tongues. Well, pastor, they're the same. They are not the same. It's clearly dis distinguished in the Bible that they are separate. So Paul is talking about this in 1 Corinthians 12, 28. The gift of tongues is in addition to the tongues experienced with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So, the, it's just like this. It's like the gift of faith. The gift of faith is an addition to the measure of faith that you get when you're saved. You have to have a little bit of faith to be saved because you're believing in something that you don't know nothing about. So, it's the same as that. Romans 12, 3, 1 Corinthians 12, 9. You can read that about that. So, everyone may not receive the gift of tongues, but in every case... Where the initial evidence of the holy baptism is recorded, all, somebody say all, all, all spoke in tongues. Acts 2, 4, 10, 44, 19, 7, all of them when they received the baptism of the Holy Ghost spoke in tongues. Amen. Now, let's talk about our prayer language for just a minute. It's a personal, personal devotion to God. I didn't talk so fast my mouth dry. Hallelujah. I even sound different, didn't I? All right. So tongues are also manifested in a believer's personal life. Why? For prayer and for worship. 
This is their communication. This is like the secret hotline to God, all right? In the spirit, man. Now, what do I mean by that? No one understands what you're saying. Not even the devil, all right? Not even the devil. These tongues are not meant to be understood by man. So therefore, they do not need an interpretation. All right? 1 Corinthians 14, 2. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaks mysteries. Romans 8, 26. The spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, 14 and 15, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the understanding also. So in other words, I can pray in my prayer language, but I also can pray in my natural. Amen. I can pray in my understanding. Do I need to? No. I don't need to because the Holy Spirit, the Father, knows what I'm saying in my prayer language. Therefore, I don't have to say it in the natural because when I say it in the natural, then it gives open grounds, in my opinion, for the enemy to do something. You hear me say it all the time. Lord, give me patience. And then next thing you know, something happens and your patience don't want out the door. Amen. It just happens like that sometimes. So, tongues are for the personal edification of the believer. They are for self-encouragement and uplifting of your own spirit. Paul said in 14.4 of 1 Corinthians, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. Now remember what I told you about the E-T-H on the end of words in King James. That means to never cease or always taking place. So if it's an edifieth himself, then we constantly pray in our prayer language and we constantly what? Edify ourselves. Man. So whether tongues of interpretation or tongues of your prayer language, the Holy Ghost will never allow confusion to come into the house of God. All right. So I need, just need everybody to grab the seat, grab your leg, just grab something. Don't throw nothing at me. Amen. Don't look at me like you're sucking on a lemon, but everybody smile. The Holy Ghost will never interrupt. What do I mean by that, Pastor? It means he will never interrupt in the middle of something taking place that was already structured. All right, so what do I mean by that? Pastor Jennifer's up here singing, and we're singing, How Great Is Our God. How great is our God. How great is our Tongues just ain't going to come in the middle of it. You need to hold that. I'm not saying it's not a tongue of interpretation. Understand what I'm saying. I'm saying it's not the right time. Okay. Now, if she's over here and she's done saying how great is our God, and she's just in the moment, and we all just kind of out there praying, and praying, it's, it's different. But it's not going to come and interrupt her in the middle of her saying how great is our, and somebody goes in tongues. If that happens, she's done got permission from me. She does not stop singing, and she does not stop playing. She gets louder. Do you understand me? It's not to, uh, to, uh, to uh, what's the word I'm trying to say? It's not to say that anybody's wrong. That's not what I'm saying. It's just the wrong time, okay? For everything that takes place with the Holy Ghost, it's done in the right time. It's decently and in order. All right. So remember that when you feel like, oh, man, I got to. Now, I don't know how many of you have been up to the Revival Center uh, during the last uh, few weeks for the Great Awakening. Now, they do something a little different. I don't quite understand how they do it yet. Not saying it's wrong. Understand me. I just don't know how they're doing it yet. They have, they have set up a structure, and you may know more about it before you came down here. But they will, Pastor Jeremiah will actually say, there's a tongue in the house that needs to be released. Go ahead, David, and release it. So that David has done went to somebody and said, hey, I feel like I have a tongue, but she's up there singing, so I know that ain't right, but I want him to know that I have it. If it's of God, guess what will happen when he says, David, release it. David's going to still have it if it's of God. Now, if David missed it, then David's going to be like, well, maybe I was wrong. 
Does it mean that David's in trouble? No, it doesn't mean David's in trouble. It means that we're all learning, y'all. We're all learning daily, okay? So understand what I'm, what I'm saying here. It's not going to interrupt in the middle of me preaching. I'm not going to be in the middle like right now and somebody just goes speaking in tongues. Because what I'm going to say is, hold that right there. And then you're going to get offended. Lord willing, you won't because you done prayed that tonight. Everybody that's in here, you done prayed. You won't get offended and leave the church. But you have to understand that would be out of order. Why, Pastor? Because it's interrupting the Word of God coming forth. All right? And that's just like a child that comes up when two adults are speaking and they need to be popped in their mouth. Not that I would do that, Facebook, but they need to be smacked. All right. So it's always done decently and in order. Amen. I've never hit my kids in the mouth. All right. First Corinthians, I've wanted to. First Corinthians 13, 8 through 10. Whether they be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether they be tongues, they shall cease. Whether they be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Now, this is where people and other denominations say it has ceased. I'm going to clarify this. I've done it before, but I'm going to do it again. When that which is perfect is come. That is translated from the Greek phrase teleon. T-E-L-E-I-O-N. Teleon. The word teleon is a singular term which refers to Jesus Christ. Hear me now. So in the, the Thayer's Greek English, it defines the phrase to teleon as used here in 1 Corinthians 13, 10, the perfect state of all things to be ushered in by the return of Christ from heaven. When that which is perfect is come. Christ has not come from heaven yet. Therefore, it has not ceased Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, Now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then when that which is perfect is come, shall I know even as also I am known. When the church having reached the state of perfection is when it stands face to face in the presence of God. There, then there will be no need for prophecies, tongues, knowledge, Wisdom, healings, all these things when we're standing in the presence. But until that which is perfect, which is Jesus Christ, has come, that which is in part will remain. Amen. So as long as there remains prophecies and knowledge and wisdom and healings and miracles and faith and discernment, tongues shall not cease either. So Paul has instructed the church to lack in no gift, but wait for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in 1 Corinthians 1-7. Believe the truth of God's word and not what man always says. Do what I just did. Take the scriptures and search them out. The Bible says, for in them you find life. It's in the scriptures that this happens, all right? So here's the thing. If you're not baptized with the Holy Ghost and you want to be, there's a couple things you need to do. First of all, you need to make sure you got no unforgiveness in your life. Unforgiveness will prevent God from moving more than anything else. And you need no unforgiveness in your life. Does that mean that, that I may have unforgiveness towards somebody now and therefore I don't have to get, that's not what I'm saying. But if I don't have the gift and I'm trying to get the gift, I need not to have any unforgiveness in my life. All right? So really that's probably the second thing. The first thing needs to be you need to be saved. You need to be saved. You, to, in order to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you have to be saved. All right? So you must be born again. You must be saved. You must repent of your sins. Now, then after you do that, then you need to make sure you don't have no unforgiveness in your life. All these things. Now, what about people that you know that have been baptized with the Holy Spirit, and I'm trying to finish up, uh, that have things in their life, okay? Well, how are they able? Listen to me. God knows the heart of every person, all right? You do not know somebody's heart. Just because they're struggling with something, addictions or whatever, does not mean they cannot be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Now, 
if their desire is for God to take that away, then God can baptize them with the Holy Ghost. But if their desire is I'm not more going to give up doing cocaine, then birds that fly, I will never receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But if my heart is, God, take this away. God, I need you more than ever. I need the baptism of the Holy Ghost because I know it's going to help me. Then guess what? God will baptize you with the Holy Ghost for the Holy Ghost. What I say a while ago, it tames the tongue, so it tames the thing in the way you act. It will help deliver you from these things. Do you understand that? All right. Why did I speak on this tonight? Because Sunday's Pentecost Sunday. And I want you to be ready. If you have not been baptized with the Holy Ghost, you pray from today until Sunday, and I believe you get feel Sunday morning. But it has to be a heart's desire. The Bible says, He that uh, hungers and thirsts after righteousness shall be filled. And the last time I checked, the Holy Ghost was righteous. All right? So we need to hunger and thirst for that. We need to ask God to deliver us from whatever it is. If we have unforgiveness or we're not sure, we need to say, God, show me any unforgiveness that I have. Look, unforgiveness is the number one reason people don't get healed. Unforgiveness is a major no-no in God's, in God's world. All right? So you cannot have unforgiveness. Did you give me that scripture today about that? What scripture did you give me? Matthew 18. Let me go right here. And then I'm gonna then I'm gonna hush. Y'all tired of hearing me, I know. Is that before Mark or after? I'm just kidding, y'all. 18, what'd you say? All right. And hit where's my, my glasses all right there? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. We know this is where, let me just back up. Let me just back up. The unforgiving servant. Right. And when he had begun, I'm going back to 24. When he began to sell accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and that all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, I have, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Then the master of the servant was moved with compassion, released and forgave him the debt. But the servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He's saying this to the same man that just asked his master to give him pay. And when he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly father also will do to you. It's each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother. So let me tell you, that's a mic dropping moment right there. Do not hold unforgiveness in your heart. As Christians, we cannot and must not. He just said he will deliver you over to the tortures when you, have un when you are holding unforgiveness in your life. Amen? Amen? All right. Stand to your feet. Let me pray for you. Bless you tonight. Be in prayer. Look, if you say, Pastor, I have the gift of the Holy Ghost. Pray for somebody that doesn't. Say, Lord, somebody will be here Sunday that doesn't have it. Everybody's not here on Wednesday night, so everybody's not able to hear it. That's why I ask you to share this. So if some that aren't able to come will be here Sunday, we're going to believe Sunday that there's going to be an impartation, a manifestation of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So if you're a full of the Holy Ghost between now and Sunday, I want you praying in the Spirit every time the Holy Spirit brings it to your members. And he's going to do it because I'm fixing to pray that he does it. Amen. Amen. And that ain't being prideful or boastful. I just believe my prayers. 
we'll go to heaven. Amen. Let me pray for you tonight. Now, look, after I pray, after I bless you, if you need prayer, you come down, and we're going to pray for you for anything. Even if it's to prepare your heart for Sunday, we're going to pray for you for that. Amen. Father, tonight, as your word has went forth, I pray that it did not fall on deaf ears. Lord, I pray that every person that would be watching this tonight by Facebook or YouTube that will be here Sunday, I pray right now, God, you prepare their hearts. Father, I'm not saying that the baptism of the Holy Ghost is what we need to get into heaven. But, Lord, I know I could not make it to heaven without it. So, Lord, tonight, every person that's in this room right now, those that will be watching that are full of the Holy Ghost, I pray right now between now and Sunday morning, you quicken them to pray for those that would be seeking the Holy Ghost baptism come Sunday. Father, I thank you for your word that brings forth life. I thank you, Lord, that in it we find the truth of your word. Lord, it's in the word of God that we see the Father's heart. And Lord, I thank you for it. So, Master, tonight, I pray just as I saw your heart in the scriptures, the people in this room saw my heart. Lord, do what you need to do in the lives of people tonight. From now until Sunday, Lord, quicken them of things, unforgiveness that needs to be released, addictions that need to be released. I pray tonight, Father, that people's hearts would be prepared. Oh, Lord, just as you say, that's clay upon the potter's wheel. I pray right now, God, that the clay is being shaped and molded into what you would need it to be. Now, Father, there's nothing that anyone in this room can do between now and Sunday but believe our prayers. So, Lord, we're believing for a great manifestation. We're believing that people will be set free and delivered. We're believing for salvations. We're believing for the gifts of the Spirit to flow in this house. We're believing for life change for Jesus Christ. We're believing for financial breakthrough in people's lives. We're believing for marriages to be restored. We're believing for deaf ears to be open. We're believing for blinded eyes to be open. We're believing for lame to be able to stand up and walk. We're believing in the mighty name of Jesus. We are the church of Jesus Christ. And the same spirit that did it then can do it now. So, Lord, we stand upon your word tonight. Now, Lord, I thank you for your people for allowing me to have a moment in their life to speak into them. So I pray tonight, Lord, that you would bless them and be gracious to them, that your face would shine on them and your countenance would be lifted on them. I call them blessed in the city and blessed in the field, blessed when they come and when they go. I ask you today, Father, to bless their families, their homes, their wealth, their health, their children, their finances, their businesses. I pray tonight that everything they put their hands to would prosper just as their soul would prosper. The Father, tonight, I decree and declare that no weapon formed against your people would prosper and every tongue that rise against them in judgment would be cast down. Holy Spirit, have your way in our lives. Now, Lord, tonight, as the enemy would try to rush in like a flood and steal this word I ask that you lift a standard against them in the mighty name of Jesus now Father we give you all the praise and all the glory tonight it's in that mighty name of Jesus that we pray and believe that we have received in Jesus name Amen, Amen can we give the Lord one more hand alright hey Pastor Harold here again uh, coming to you live I want to say thank you for watching that message. I pray and believe that it has changed your life for Jesus Christ. And so today, if you made a commitment to serve the Lord, maybe for the first time, or maybe you was rededicating your life to the Lord, we want to know about it right here at Abundant Life for Sight. You can hit us up on our Facebook page by Messenger and just simply type, let us know that you uh, made that decision today because we want to get in contact with you and let you know what your next step is as a child of God. We also want to encourage you to find a church home. We believe your church home is right here. God has led you to watch uh, our sermon today, our messages, and we believe that he has drawn you to this house. And so we would like to hear from you. We'd like to see you here at our services at one uh, Sunday's 9 or 11 a.m. We also have Wednesday night service. 
at 7 p.m. with complete youth ministry, children's ministry, the whole nine yards. Hey, we want to see and hear from you. Also, I want to just simply touch base. A lot of people ask us how they can sow into this ministry. Well, there's several ways that you can do it. Number one, you can mail it to 962 Juliet Road, Forsyth, Georgia, 31029. You can also download our app. Our app is called Abundant Life Church Georgia. You can find that either in iTunes or on Google Play. It's a free app. Download it. You can go on there and click on the Forsyth campus. Give to Forsyth. You can give that way. You can also give through our online website. Now, that I'll have to get you a little bit more information on. But if you would like to send a prayer request, you can also send a prayer request uh, through email to ForsythInfo at AbundantLifeChurch.com. The last thing, you can always contact us by phone and we can give you any information you need. Our phone number is uh, 470-369-7300. Hey, I pray and believe that God has touched you today and I want to hear from you. Hey, stay tuned. We got a lot of messages coming your way. God bless you and have a great day.